duty, duty must be done. The rule applies to everyone. And painful though that duty be, to shirk the task were fiddle-dee-dee. You probably know it from Radigal, but I first heard it in The Pirates of Penzance. In that musical, Frederick is a slave of duty, and duty is king. Even when his so-called duty doesn't make sense, even when it's morally questionable, like being loyal to the band of pirates he has found himself apprenticed to, it must be done. Now, in this case, it's certainly exaggerated, but underlying it is a very real question. As Christians, are we all just slaves of duty? Are we supposed to simply grit our teeth and do what we're told is right? You see, we in Women's Bible Study are about to start three weeks looking at the book of Titus. And very often we're going to hear about doing what is right or good. Many of us tend to think that as Christians, we are simply to fulfill our duties, to try our best to live good lives. And as we read Titus, it might sometimes feel like we are just being told what we are to do. But the wonderful thing about the teaching in Titus is that duty always follows doctrine. What comes first is not instructions for us to follow, but the good news of the gospel. It's the joyful reality of what Jesus has done for us, which then changes us and enables us to live different lives. And we'll be encouraged to see ourselves not as slaves, but as saved. And that in turn will transform everything about us. But before we get too far, it will be really useful for us to see a little bit of the context of the book of Titus. So, uh, Titus is a letter. It was written by Paul in about the mid-60s. Um, that's between Paul's first imprisonment. You can read about that one in Acts chapter 28. And his second imprisonment, which you can read about in 1 Timothy and in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul introduces himself as two things. He firstly introduces himself as a servant of God, and secondly, as an apostle of Christ Jesus. So Paul has been sent to serve. He talks about advancing the faith of God's elect. So teaching God's word to those whom God has called. And so Titus has established a church on the island of Crete in Greece. Now, Crete, what a place. It is a hotbed of immorality and evil. In fact, the poet Epimenides is quoted in Titus chapter 1 verse 12 and this is what he says. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. So they served the Olympic gods and morally speaking, they are not much better than your average Cretan. Uh, these gods operated by making all manner of demands on the mortals who lived below. And yet, in Acts chapter 2, we read reports that a number of Cretans who heard the gospel at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, 
turned to Jesus. And it seems likely uh, that these people were the foundation of that Cretan church, which Paul established and which Titus is now at the helm of. So, enter Titus. He is a Greek by birth. And he's mentioned in Galatians, as well as several times in 2 Corinthians. But here, uh, Paul refers to him as his true son. As we've seen, though, Titus has really got his work cut out for him in Crete. Where should he begin? How do you bring about reform in a situation like this? How do you promote self-controlled, upright and godly lives, as Paul writes in chapter 2? Even within Titus's church, there are problems. There is a leader who is peddling a false gospel. There are women who seem to be habitually drunk. There are young men struggling with self-control. How is Titus to bring about goods in Crete. What's the key? Somehow, duty isn't going to cut the mustard. Well, this is probably a good place uh, to begin and to read the passage that we'll be looking at today. It's just four verses which will serve as an introduction to the whole book. So we're going to read together Titus chapter 1 and just the first Four verses. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time, manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Saviour. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. So the major theme in Titus, the, the idea or the motif that keeps coming back again and again, is that knowing what is true leads to doing what is good. So we see that belief controls behaviour, doctrine shapes duty, or gospel enables godliness. And here in these first four verses, we see Paul reminding Titus of what is at the heart of what followers of Jesus believe. And Paul here draws his attention to hope, hope in the past, in the present and in the future. And the word hope here means complete certainty of eternal life. Have a look down at verse 2. It's been promised by God in time past. And God doesn't lie. He's not a Cretan. He's not one of their gods. No, Paul's God, our God, is completely trustworthy. And he's made a promise about the future. The hope that was promised in the past will be fulfilled in the future. It will come to pass. Titus can be sure of that. His church can be sure of that. And we, you and I, can be sure of that too. And so it's stretched between these two pillars of hope promised and hope fulfilled is the present. And in the present, what we see is hope preached. Or as Paul says, manifested in his word, God's words. Paul has been entrusted with this message and commanded to preach it. And as he does, people will experience hope for themselves. And they will do two things. 
They will put their faith in God and they will come to know the truth. So faith and knowledge, Paul says, rest on the hope of eternal life. But what has brought about such a hope? There is a bit of an answer in verse 3. There we read that God is the saviour. So there is hope because of what God has done, because of his salvation. But there's also a bit more in Paul's greeting to Titus in verse 4. So grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our saviour. Paul's really given Titus the gospel in a nutshell here. Favour with God, so grace, and reconciliation with him, so peace, is found in Jesus Christ. And this restored relationship is the reason that Titus and the Cretans and we ourselves can be certain of eternal life. And because of this hope, faith in God and knowledge of the truth are possible. And as we saw in verse 1, they are the things that lead to godliness. So remember that theme that we're coming back to. Knowing what is true leads to doing what is good. So when those whom God has chosen put their faith in him and they come to know the truth, a great transformation occurs because they change. They start to become godly. And Paul knew this firsthand, didn't he? He had gone from being a persecutor of the church, as he writes to the Philippians, to a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. His entire world had been turned upside down and Titus, who once had been a Greek pagan, also experienced a complete revolution when he repented and believed the gospel. It is important to be clear here that we are not just talking about trying to be better. When we think about godliness, often what happens is that we tend to look inwards. And there, of course, we see very clearly all of our shortcomings and our weaknesses and our failures. We see how much we lack. And so we resolve ourselves to try harder, to do better at godliness, to become more like Jesus. And we think, I've got to stop shouting at the kids. I've got to waste less time. I've got to read the Bible more often. I've got to actually remember what I read when I read the Bible. I've got to try to talk more about Jesus at work. I've got to give more money to church. The problem, though, is that our attitude so often is one of trying to do these things out of duty because we think that that's what God wants from us, that he wants good behaviour. But you see, godliness in Titus is, about, is more about what God wants for us than it is about what we think we should be. It's not about trying to do better. It's about seeking truth and it's about allowing that to transform us. So God's truth liberates us to live radically changed lives. And the wonderful thing is that as we read Titus over the next three weeks, we're going to continue to see how that affects three different spheres. How it affects us in the church, how it affects us in the home and how it affects us in the world. And we will also see how Jesus himself is the example of godliness. Not because he managed to do all the good religious stuff, but because he lived out gospel truth. You see, we come back to that theme again. Knowing what is true leads to doing what is good. And so this all brings us to a question. What does my own life show about what I believe? Now, I, I hasten to say, I understand that might well seem like a very 
overwhelming, a very burdening type of question. How on earth could you and I achieve that kind of life? But you see, that's not quite the point. It's not so much a question of what you are doing, but a question of what you are believing. So, do you have the hope of eternal life? Have you received grace and peace through Jesus? Is your faith and your knowledge based on that hope? Because that kind of faith and knowledge will lead to godliness. Day by day, you'll be seeking and living out truth like Jesus did. And just the natural outworking of all of this is transformation. You'll experience change and you'll desire to live it out more and more. And this teaching of God's word is our fuel for discipleship. So we will get into some of the practical details of all of this as we spend the next three weeks studying Titus in our small groups. But for today... It's important that we see that teaching matters. What we hear at church from our pastors, our ministers, our teachers, our leaders has an impact on our day to day. Our lives are going to reflect the gospel that we hear. And so our godliness rests in the hands of our teachers. And so, friends, we must pray for our teachers and our leaders. We must ask God to keep them faithful to his word. And we must prioritise that truth. Not the teacher's appearance, not their delivery, not their relatability, not the community of the church, not our own comforts, but their teaching of the truth which accords with godliness. And so let's make sure we're doing that. Let's make sure that we're placing a really high value on the right and faithful teaching of God's word in our churches. Let's remember to keep it at the centre, to know that it matters most, to value it more than the good things like friends at church or maybe the feeling that we get from church. It's God's word that has the power to save us and to change us. And so let's listen well to the truth as it is taught, well enough to be captured by it and changed by it. And let's encourage our leaders, our preachers. Let's thank them when they teach God's word clearly and faithfully. Let's be consistent in praying for them as they seek to do that. We have been hearing from the book of Titus that knowing what is true leads to doing what is good. And so why don't we spend a few minutes just asking for God's help over the next three weeks as we learn together and live that out. Let me lead us in prayer. Father God, we give you great thanks for your word to us. Thank you for those who teach it to us and who live it out. We ask for your blessing on them, that you would continue to give them all that they need to teach us your truth with clarity and faithfulness. Please help us to highly value good teaching. Thank you, Father, for the hope that we have, the hope that you promised in the past that will be fulfilled in the future and which is being preached in the present. Thank you, Father, that it is the gospel that enables godliness, that it's not rooted in our own efforts, but in your saving work at the cross. And please help us over the coming weeks to live changed and transformed lives in accordance with what we hear from your words. We ask these things in the name of your Son, and the power of your spirits. Amen.